thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor, and our MCs today. The uh, chairperson of council, Andrew Temela, Tembega Mwai Tobi, and uh, members of council. And of course, Vice Chancellor and Principal Professor Sonna, and the management staff, students, and workers at Walter Sisulu University, and the dear members of the Sisulu family, and I see Max here, I see Elena here with us, <coughs> and of course others, uh, Lindy Sisulu and others, uh, comrades and, and friends. First of all, I'd like to thank the esteemed Vice Chancellor of the Walter Sisulu University, <coughs> Professor Solna, for inviting me to deliver this lecture on an outstanding and beloved leader of our people, Tamela Walter Sisulu. And I feel especially honored that I do this at this particular university, which carries his indelible name. <coughs> I'm also happy to know that I deliver this lecture on an important day in our history, June 26, uh, 60 years, 66 years ago, the Congress of the People meeting in Cape Town in Johannesburg adopted that historic document as uh, a Freedom Charter. <coughs> and this day, the 26th of June was, and is important because it was marked by the liberation movement since 1950 as Freedom Day. I must confess, uh, Vice Chancellor and friends that uh, I shan't talk about the Freedom Charter today. But some of the matters that arise because of the posture that was taken in that document. <coughs> and this year we also celebrate the 25th anniversary of the adoption of the National Constitution, that national compact which binds all of us to build the kind of South Africa it defines. And as all of us know, our Vice Chancellor and Principal Professor Sonna assumed her high office on the 1st of April this year. I'm therefore honored to dedicate this lecture to her first 100 days in office, which will be in three days' time. <clears throat> Confident that under her leadership, this irreplaceable institution of higher learning will make new and important advances. We were also convened during the third period of the National Days of Mourning in Zambia and in our country, proclaimed by Presidents Edgar Lungu and Cyril Ramaphosa respectively, to honor and pay respects to that outstanding African patriot, the statesperson and uh, freedom fighter KK, President Kenneth Kaunda. We too take this moment humbly to salute and celebrate this extraordinary African, the last of a generation of priceless breed, of a priceless breed of African leaders who led our continent to its independence. It was indeed with a great feeling, a feeling of great celebration that almost two decades ago, acting on behalf of our Democratic Republic, I was privileged to admit President Kaunda into the esteemed ranks of the members of the Order of the Companions of Over Tambo. And I believe that we'll have time to, in future to speak more about this direct architect of our liberation, KK, whom we addressed as Comrade President, especially to talk about the legacy he has bestowed to all of us as we continue to share as aspirations for the unity and renaissance of our continent of Africa. As all of us know, that other outstanding African patriot and freedom fighter, our irreplaceable and beloved leader, Tamela Walter Sisulu, passed away on the 5th of May, 2003, aged 91 years. Uh, Twelve days later, on the 17th of May, I was honored to deliver the funeral oration as we were about to lay to rest his mortal remains at the end of a solemn and dignified official funeral. <coughs> I began that oration in these words. 
Our country and nation itself have been in mourning since that fateful day, the 5th of May, when Walter Sisulu ceased to breathe. <coughs> While he lived, there were many in our country who knew nothing about him, except perhaps what they had been told or not told by those who had been his jailers. <coughs> While he lived, there were many who did not understand the unwavering humanism of the cause to which he dedicated his whole life. We were blind to what he did to ensure that his movement and his people remain forever loyal to their humanist calling. <coughs> when these came to know that there had been such a gentle giant in their midst, hidden from them as though he did not exist, they asked themselves the questions, question why did we not know? But there were many others who knew of the place he occupied among the great galaxy of leaders of our people who had given their all to ensure that all our people and all Africa were liberated from oppression, poverty and underdevelopment, and the intolerable pain of contempt and humiliation. They knew that Walter Sisulu belonged among those through the generations who are the best representatives of the unheralded nobility of the masses of our people, <coughs> the representatives who decided that their lives were worth nothing unless they dedicated those lives to the service of all our people. Having said all of this, I thought it right that perhaps as an epitaph on Tadasi Sulu's grave, we could inscribe the famous words of the poet laureate Konem Kai when he spoke of those other heroes, the hundreds who perished when the sailing ship Mendy sank in the cold English Channel. And so I said of he who had been driven to act as he did throughout his adult years, inspired only by the noble sentiment of selfless service to the people, as in the ngazo as in the ngayo imibengo. I'm certain that all of us will recall that the defense during the Livonia trial <coughs> used Walter Sisulu as in fact his principal witness, a responsibility he discharged with distinction as you people in this world would say, truly cum laude. <coughs> At some point, Dr. Sisulu was interrogated by a lead defense counsel, the advocate Bram Fisher, you see, and he has one particular exchange. Advocate, advocate Fisher asked, and when you were detained for 90 days, that is to say from the day of the arrest at Rivonia, were you approached and interrogated in any way? And Walter Sisulu responded, yes, I was, by interrogated by members of the special branch several times. They said that they believed I was in possession of vital information which would help the state, and that I was facing a very grave charge, the penalty for which is death. They told me I could escape if I was prepared to give evidence, or rather to give them information confidentially. They said it would not be known by anybody, and they told me that some of the Europeans, that is the whites, had already spoken and given information about me. They repeated examples of the rebellion of 1914, when Yopi Furin was hanged. I have, however said I would never give information about my colleagues, and they could do what they wished. And so Bram Fisher said, and so you did not accept any offer, though it might have, may have saved you from the death penalty. And Walter Sisulu responded, yes. The journalist John Carlin uh, interviewed Dada Sisulu after he was released from prison in 1989. And here is part of that exchange. And Carlin asked, on the day before the sentencing, at the Rivonia trial, what do you remember of Mandela's state of mind, his behavior on that very night? And Tadasa Sulu responded, well, I can't specifically say I remember this, but I remember that his reaction was made up, that he must face the situation. 
But I made up my mind. I was convinced that there was no way of escaping the death penalty. That's how I looked at it. I looked at the cases that were going on, comparatively minor cases. Sentences were very heavy. <coughs> and I reasoned that if uh, that be the case with ordinary rank and file leadership, where you have people who, liberate, who deliberately were prepared for prison, you must naturally expect that the death penalty would be inevitable. And Colin, did you have any said, did you have any plans in the event of getting the death sentence? Was Nelson going to give a speech or something, or had you looked for far, that far ahead? And Comrade Walter said, yes, we did look at the question that the very fact that in the said I was chosen to play a particular part, Nelson would play a particular part, therefore we had different parts to play, and I wanted Nelson to take the line he took, the line of defying, of speaking, irrespective of the consequences of what would be, of speaking as a leader, fearlessly. And Colin said, the sort of great historical moment, that would be the idea. And Comrade Walter responded, yes, as for myself, I'd reached the position of deciding my personal role yeah. That is the death penalty. I must face it with courage. I will, in fact, sing when I go to the death sentence to the gallows. And Colin said, You actually pictured that. And Comrade Walter said, Yes, that's right. I worked at that properly, that this is a situation where there is no way in which we can avoid the death penalty in terms of the laws of the country. Therefore, my own situation is that if we are sentenced, and I thought at least four of us, if we are sentenced to death, and I should go to the gallows singing in order to indicate my determination for the other people who may come. The conversations I've just cited between Tata Sulu on one hand and Pam Fisher and John Cullen on the other, Tell us this very important story about Comrade Walter Sisul. In him, our liberation movement, led by the ANC and the people of South Africa, were blessed to have to indicate my determination for the other people who may come. The conversations I've just cited between Tata Sisul on one hand and Bram Fisher and John Cullen on the other, tell us this very important story about Comrade Walter Sisul. In him, our liberation movement, led by the ANC and the people of South Africa, were blessed to have a true revolutionary who would never betray his comrades, the struggle and the revolution, who was prepared to sacrifice his life for the revolution to succeed, who would go to the gallows singing to give courage and set an example to future generations never to betray the people. Knowing all this about Comrade Walter Sisulu, I thought it most fitting that to thank him for his invaluable contribution to the liberation of our country and people, we should borrow other words from the poet laureate. The Nambe, Jengomye, or Sebens Lay, the Kanyan Jengomso, or Kakambilay. And so when we say in Dingan, Dingema Nayan Gomtlavo Vuko, this is to pay tribute to the role Walter Sisulu played to help ensure the defeat of the apartheid regime and the victory of the democratic revolution. And in this regard, there is no gain saying the fact that the ANC played a leading role in securing that victory, and that Walter Sisul was a very important member of the collective leadership of that movement. When he joined the ANC in 1940, the organization had become virtually moribund, facing the threat of withering out of existence. 
But fortunately, a new leadership was elected with uh, A.B. Koma becoming president and James Kalata, the Secretary General. And under their leadership began a process, began a process affecting both the ANC and the struggle as a whole, which through a number of strategic stages led to the victory of 1994. Certainly Walter Sisulu would not have known in 1940 that he would play a central role in all of those stages. And the first stage consisted in the, consisted in the rebuilding of the ANC among others, that process led to the formation of the Youth League, ANC Youth League, and the ANC Women's League. And Walter Sisulu, one of the founders of the Youth League, was elected to serve as its treasurer. And that process of rebuilding also included a more detailed elaboration of the ANC vision for a new South Africa, spelled out in the document adopted in 1943, the Africans' claims. <coughs> And we can say that uh, that first stage of the rebuilding of the ANC concluded with the adoption by the ANC of the 1949 Program of Action. And Comrade Walter was central to this as the program was tabled and promoted by the ANC at, the, at the ANC National Conference by the Youth League. And that same National Conference, which adopted the Program of Action, elected Comrade Walter as a full-time Secretary General of the ANC, replacing Reverend Kalata, who had been part-time. And that 1949 Program of Action defined the major struggles the ANC led until it was banned in 1960. And these were mass struggles which represented a strategic break from the previous approach of the ANC since its foundation, which effectively consisted in petitioning the successive white minority regimes. And through the apartheid regime, though the apartheid regime banned Comrade Walter from membership of the ANC and participating in his activities in 1954, he continues to serve in its leadership. And the implementation of the program of action through the masses of the people directly into struggle, helping to prepare millions of the oppressed for the sustained offensive which forced the apartheid regime to enter into negotiations to, end, negotiations to end apartheid rule. And this process further entrenched the ANC as a trusted leader of these masses, and therefore the center which would end up recognized by the overwhelming majority of these masses as their authentic representative. Again, Comrade Walter played a central role in helping, helping to bring about the strategic outcomes. And of course, it was also during this period of the sustained implementation of the program of action that, as we have said, the Congress of the People convened in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, <clears throat> and 66 years ago today, adopted the seminal policy document, the Freedom Charter, which succeeded the Africans' claims. And yet again, though he was banned, Comrade Walter played a critical role in those processes. And the campaign to implement the program of action reinforced and expanded an important process initiated during the Kuma presidency of the ANC, marked by what came to be known as the Kuma Dadunaika Pact, in fact, the birth of the United Congress movement, which helped to bring freedom to our country. It was also that Congress movement which got together at the Congress of the People and produced the Freedom Charter. All this entrenched in the ANC the understanding of the strategic consideration of the vital importance of building a broad front for a sustained offensive against a common enemy. It was this development which ultimately led to the ANC opening its ranks to all South Africans and later the formal emergence of the tripartite alliance of the ANC, the SACP, and COSAT. And needless to say, Again, Comrade Walter played an important role, a role in cultivating the United Front during the period of the implementation of the program of action and its enrichment after he came out of prison in 1989. But as all of us know, the strength and the militancy of the mass struggle panicked the apartheid regime, which carried out the criminal Sharpeville massacre in March 1960, 
and follow this by banning the ANC and the PAC. Refusing to accept this eventuality, the ANC leadership, Walter Sisulu among them, took three important decisions. One of these was that rather than dissolve, the ANC would reconstitute itself as an underground organization. The second was that it would form an external mission based outside South Africa. <clears throat> the third was that it would break its 50-year period of nonviolent struggle and take up arms, <clears throat> leading to the formation and activation of Mkondo Sizwe in 1961. And the latter did not mean the abandonment of mass struggles as showed, for instance, by the stay at home called to oppose the declaration of a republic by the apartheid regime on the 1st of May 1961, as well as the advance of the demand for an inclusive non-racial national convention to draw up a new constitution for South Africa. I would like to believe that many of us will recall that years later, speaking from Lusaga, Zambia, the ANC leadership called the construct I've just described as the four pillars of our struggle. <clears throat> this being underground organization, mass struggle, armed struggle, and international solidarity. Again, Comrade Walter was intimately involved in the conceptualization and putting in place of this very new construct in terms of both fun the functioning of the ANC and the conduct of the struggle. As we know, ultimately, he and others of our leaders were captured in 1963, appeared in the Rivonia trial, and were sentenced to life imprisonment. <clears throat> but even as it prepared to launch the armed struggle in December 1961, as it organized the May Stay at Home, which called for a national convention, the ANC leadership said it preferred the latter inclusive and non-racial peaceful negotiations as the best way to end the system of white minority apartheid domination in our country. And at that point in time, the apartheid regime did not listen. But 28 years later, in August 1989, the OAU Ad Hoc Committee on Southern Africa adopted the Harare Declaration, which the ANC had drafted. That declaration, later adopted by UN General Assembly in the same year, called for negotiations to end apartheid rule and the release of political prisoners as one of the preconditions for those negotiations. Two months later, in October, that is 1989, <coughs> Comrade Walter and other political prisoners were released following Gavin Begg's release two years earlier in 1987. As all of us know, Colonel Nelson Mandela was released on February 1990. The same month, at last, and almost 30 years after it had rejected the call for a national convention in 1961, the apartheid regime agreed to participate in such an inclusive and non-racial national convention to end the system of white minority apartheid domination. And the very first negotiated agreement between the ANC and the apartheid government in 1990 was the Hrote minute, concluded on May the 4th of that year. Walter Sisul was part of the ANC delegation which negotiated this agreement. A mere six months after he was released, after 26 years in jail, and he stayed part of this negotiating process until its conclusion in 1994. And during the same year, 1994, he retired from active politics because of ill health. Nevertheless, he was present at the Union Buildings on May the 10th, when his friend and comrade of many decades, Nelson Mandela, was inaugurated as the first president of democratic South Africa. And here I must make this important point that was, it was our other beloved leader, Mama Albertina Sisulu, Comrade Walter's very dear wife and comrade, honorable member of the National Assembly, who stood up in Parliament on May 9, 1994, to nominate Nelson Mandela 
for election as President of the Republic. Towards the end of the oration at Walter Sisulu's funeral, to which I have referred, I said that one that was as mighty as the Baobab has fallen. But because he planted mighty seeds, he has risen again and will rise again in the tomorrows and the new beds that the African sun will bring. That sun will supply as well the living energy that will bring to their noble maturity the little and tender and delicate plants that Walter Sisulu nurtured with such devotion and care and love. Today, 18 years after Comrade Walter passed away, we must ask ourselves the question and answer it honestly. Was this prediction correct? As he was preparing to retire from active political engagement in 1994, Comrade Walter participated in preparing the election manifesto the ANC adopted for our first democratic elections. That manifesto said, among others, on 27 April, for the first time in our history, all of us will stand tall and proud as equal citizens in our common home. And to eradicate the serious problems called by, caused by apartheid, South Africa needs a government with the political will to meet the challenge. A government that understands the needs of the future because it understands the neglect and division of the past. We need a government that puts people first. And it said the ANS is a home for all South Africans, and our strength flows from our roots among the people. And that is why we inspired people's resistance during the darkest moments. That is why we initiated and led the negotiation process. Our program reflects years of people's struggles and is informed by their aspirations. The ANS is ready to govern. We are ready to listen. And it said, while others throw up their hands in despair or point fingers, we want to roll up our sleeves and tackle the problems. We are aware that eliminating the mess created over decades by the National Party will not be easy. But we know that you can make a, we can, you can make a difference if we all work together, we are capable of achieving even more. And it said democracy means more than just the vote. It, it must, must be measured by the quality of life of ordinary people, men and women, young and old, rural and urban. It means giving all South Africans the opportunity to share in the country's wealth, to contribute to its development, and to improve their own lives. Together, let's change South Africa so that once and for all our country can know peace and security, so that we can join the rest of humankind as a proud and united people working together for a better world. Now is the time. Today, 18 years after Comrade Walter passed away, we must ask ourselves a question and again answer it honestly. Have we, the ANC, kept the promise that we made to the people? To answer the first question about whether our prediction about what Comrade Walter represented, what he wished for in terms of the ANC, let us first hear what the ANC says about itself. As many of us probably know, in the resolution on the organizational renewal, its organizational renewal, December 2017, 54th National Conference of the ANC said that some of the principal challenges facing the ANC are that there is a, there is a loss of confidence in the ANC because of social distance, corruption, nepotism, arrogance, elitism, factionalism, manipulating organizational processes, abusing state power, putting self-interest above the people. And it said even the strongest ANC supporters agree the sins of incumbency are deeply entrenched. Many organizations and thought leaders have become critics of the ANC and its leadership, and we're losing much of our influence and appeal among students, young intellectuals, and the black middle class. 
and said there are also leadership weaknesses and loss of integrity, characterized by competition to control state resources, factionalism, conflict, ill-discipline and disunity, and the use of state institutions to settle differences. Slates and vote buying have delivered leaders who have difficulty driving our programs or commanding respect from society and our supporters. Again, as you will recall, later in August last year, ANC President Comrade Cyril Ramaphosa issued an important letter to the members of the ANC and did let this be a turning point in our fight against corruption. And the President wrote, today, the ANC and its leaders stand accused of corruption. The ANC may not stand alone in the dock, but it does stand as accused number one. This is the stark reality that we must now confront. Responding to the bleak situation facing the ANC, the 54th National Conference said organizational renewal, therefore, is an absolute and urgent priority. And you may go as far as to say to the very survival of our great movement. But what happened which caused the ANC to sink into the lower depths described by Comrade uh, President Ramaphosa and the 54th National Conference? In this regard, I'd like to remind all of us what our late esteemed Comrade President Nelson Mandela said 24 years ago at the 50th National Conference of the ANC, three years after the ANC effectively took power as our country's governing party. He said a number of negative features within the ANC and the broad democratic movement have emerged during the last three years. One of these negative features is the emergence of careerism within our ranks. Many among our members see their membership of the ANC as a means to advance their personal ambitions, to attain positions of power and access to resources for their own individual gratification. And he said, in reality, during the last three years, we have found it difficult to deal with such careerists in a decisive manner. We ourselves have therefore allowed the space to emerge for these opportunists to pursue their counter-revolutionary goals to the detriment of our movement and struggle. And during this period, we have also been faced with various instances of corruption involving our own members, including those who occupy positions of authority by virtue of the victory of the democratic revolution. There are also those among our members who see our movement for national liberation as a mere political party which participates in elections at the conclusion of which it, replay, it places its members in remunerated positions of authority. And as Mandela said clearly, we have to take all necessary measures to purge ourselves of such members as well as the careerists and organize ourselves in a way that will make it difficult for corrupt elements to gain entry into our movement. And before I say anything else about all of these matters relating to the ANC, let me quote two statements made respectively by Mr. Arthur Fraser, the former Director General of the State Security Agency, and Comrade President Jacob Zuma. In April 2019, in an April 9, 2019 documents, Arthur Fraser said that the apartheid intelligence formations were established with the mandate to maintain, advance, and protect the apartheid social system through destroying opponents of apartheid, including the destruction of the ANC and its allies. It would be naive in the extreme to assume that these apartheid intelligence operatives disappeared with the disappearance of apartheid from the law books. They are very much active and seek to influence even what may seem to be attempts to transform or correct the problems that affect 
the state security agency. They are hell-bent not just to undermine the state, but the governing party. This is not a theoretical conjecture. And Jacob Zuma delivered uh, an Oliver Tambo centenary lecture in November 2017 in Cariso on the West Front. <laughs> Among other things, he said, after the banning of our organizations and the beginning of the negotiations, the countries which were our enemies or had been our enemies got an opportunity to woo and to recruit us. They would say to us, please work with us secretly. Nobody else will know. We'll give you everything you want. You recall this is what was said to Walter Sisulu when he was interrogated by the special branch. It was repeated according to President Zuma even now. When some among us agree to these overtures, we become weaker. Comrades return from training and we give them tasks, not knowing that they are now working with the enemy as its secret agents. This person, now an enemy agent, has already been trained how to conceal himself or herself so that he or she is not discovered. He or she behaves as though he or she loves the AIDS more than all other people. And after he or she has spoken, we all decide to elect this comrade, that he should be the chairperson. They have trained him or her about what to do to get elected. It is a silent war in the process of the balance of forces. As we examine the problems we are experiencing today in the ANC, we should not look at them on the surface or merely look at individuals. We must understand that we are involved in a global war. The ill wind blowing through the ANC is not self-generated. There are those who are blowing this wind from below. It is the enemy agents who were hard at work who caused the division after the Polokwane 52nd National Conference of the ANC. That was President Zuma. I believe that after the extensive quotations I've cited to describe the malaise in the ANC and point at least to some of its causes, there is no more need for me to say anything else to add to all of that. The essential challenge is to act exactly on what the 54th ANC National Conference called for when it said organizational renewal, therefore, is an absolute and urgent priority. And we may go as far as to say to the survival, the very survival of our great movement. In this context, we must draw attention to the fact that the 2017 ANC conference said that it mandates the NEC to drive a sustained program of organizational renewal and report on such to the 2020 National General Council. To end, we must also point to the fact that in its, in this year's January 8th statement, this year's January 8th statement, the ANC NEC said, we must this year forge ahead with the fundamental renewal of the ANC. It is only an ANC with ethical, selfless, and disciplined members that can lead the national effort to reduce coronavirus infections and drive radical social and economic transformation, unquote. But here is a deeply worrying reality in this regard. The ANC NEC has done nothing to honor both the 2017 conference directive and its own 2021 commitment. Obviously and naturally the question arises, is the ANC National Executive Committee willing and able to discharge its responsibilities with regard to the absolute and urgent priority of the renewal of the ANC? I pose this question during this lecture because this is not a matter of concern only to the ANC and its members. The ANC remains the dominant political formation in our country and is likely to sustain this position for the foreseeable future. 
The 54th National Conference called for the urgent renewal of the ANC to end the corruption, the corruption, the corrosion of the government's capacity, the radical weakening and subversion of the democratic state institutions, and all the other negatives it identified. All of these negatives are a fundamental cause of the serious general political and socio-economic crisis which, in which our country is immersed. In 2017, ANC National Conference said the renewal of the ANC concerned the survival of the great movement, the survival of our great movement. In other words, failure to effect that renewal would threaten the very survival of the organization. Our political reality of the continued primacy of the ANC, which our electorate regularly elects as a national governing party, means that that very threat to the survival of the ANC simultaneously threatens our country and all 60 million citizens, which are virtually intractable general political and socio-economic general crisis. It cannot and must not be that if we, the ANC leadership, are trapped in an organizational death wish, South Africa at last acts in a manner which allows that the macabre within the ANC visits immense disaster on our already suffering population and millions of others elsewhere in our region and continent. The genuine and thoroughgoing renewal of the ANC is an urgent national imperative. It remains a prayer to the future that the ANC NEC will not be found wanting in this regard, inspired what, what, was, what was meant when in 2003 Referring to the ANC and the Democratic Revolution, we spoke about the living energy that will bring to their noble majority the little and tender and delicate plants that Walter Sisulu nurtured with such devotion and care and love. I'm certain that all of us would agree with the 1994 ANC election manifesto. Uh, after 27 years after it was composed, where it says that democracy means more than just a vote. It must be measured by the quality of life of ordinary people, men and women, young and old, rural and urban. It means giving all South Africans the opportunity to share in the country's wealth, to contribute to the development and to improve their lives. I also believe that you to be right that especially the ANC should make an honest assessment about how much the quality of life of the people has improved since the majority of our electorate first elected it as a governing party in 1994 on the basis of the manifesto, one of whose authors was Walter Sisul. Of course, this is not the moment for us to make such an assessment. However, we have to make some comments on this matter taking into account our contemporary challenges. I speak here of the discussion in our country generated by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In this regard, I must first of all congratulate our government for the close attention it is paying to the supremely important task to defeat the COVID-19 pandemic. The very dangerous current third wave emphasizes the vital importance for the population to respect and implement the directives which our government regularly issues. And indeed, I do hope that all of us will work together closely with government to defeat this pandemic. On October 21st last year, President Ramaphosa replied to the debate which had taken place in Parliament in response to his presentation of the government's economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Among others, the president said this plan is a response to a severe economic contraction unlike any we have experienced in recent memory. South Africa is not alone in experiencing an economic crisis of this depth and extent. Unemployment has risen across the country, across the world, and nearly every economy has shrunk. 
It is true that the measures that were necessary to delay the spread of the virus and prevent deaths led to a sharp decline in economic activity. And for South Africans who have been watching this debate, these are not theoretical issues. They have a direct effect on their livelihoods, their prospects for finding work, the recovery of their businesses, and indeed our collective future. And he said business owners worry about being able to cover their overheads and pay their employees. Families worry about their ability to pay their bills and see the year through. And those who are unemployed worry about their prospects in this climate of economic hardship. And even before the onset of the, pan of the pandemic, others, including COSATU, had drawn attention to the palace state of our economy. In a general, general, general 20 titled Key ESCOM and Economic Prevention Proposals, COSATU said that organized labor seek to help to stabilize and save ESCOM and its workers' jobs and ensure the economy has access to affordable and reliable electricity. Equally important are urgent interventions needed in the economy and the state as a whole to stabilize them and ensure economic growth that can begin to reduce our dangerously high and rising levels of unemployment. Our economy is facing its worst crisis since 2008. Unemployment is 40% and rising. GDP growth barely reaches 1%. There are 600,000 new job seekers annually. The state is fast running out of options. ESCOM, with a debt of 450 billion rand, is rising and rising. Is a ticking time bomb threatening to implode the state and the economy. Other state-owned enterprises are in various stages of collapse. 10% of the budget is still lost on average to corruption and wasteful expenditure. Tax revenues are declining. Cosatu, January 2020. And all of us will recall that in the exceptional circumstances by, described by President Ramaphosa and Cosatu, there was a virtual and welcome chorus that the social partners, government, business, labor, civil society should get together to implement an agreed economic recovery plan. It is interesting that COSATU saw the need for this even before the COVID-19 pandemic. In the document we've just cited, the Federation said that organized labor's approach is based upon a social compact where all parties from government to labor, business, and civil society make a contribution, and where necessary, a sacrifice for the sake of the national interest. And indeed, when President Ramaphosa presented the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan to Parliament in October last year, he said that the South African Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan builds on the common ground established by the social partners, government, labor, business, community organizations, through intensive and detailed consultations over the last few months. And he said, I wish to applaud the remarkable efforts, particularly from our social partners in NEDLEC, in reaching consensus on the actions required to rebuild our economy and the firm actions that, will, that all social partners have committed to contribute to the country's re recovery. This indeed was excellent news that for the very first time since 1994, the social partners, as already defined, were resolved and determined to join hands to rescue our country from the abyss. But here is the problem. When the Business Unity South Africa Vice President addressed the NEDLEC Summit last December, December 2020, he said, in agreement with the government and our social partners, we started engaging on the economic recovery for the short, medium, and long term. These engagements have been more challenging, and we have not made as much progress as the situation requires in agreeing upon and implementing 
fundamental issues imperative for economic growth. We need to reflect on why, during the most severe socioeconomic crisis since the birth of our democracy, we have not acted with the necessary resolve and urgency to address the economic, social, and fiscal crises we face, many aspects which pre-existed the pandemic. And he said, we offer the following observations on this. We need to move beyond ideological debates to a real-time and pragmatic, fact-based assessment of our circumstances. In that context, government must show leadership in rising above ideology to implement critical actions that are, that are in their domain. We recognize the difficulty of making hard choices and trade-offs, but that is reality confronting us and is clearly visible to all stakeholders. We may not necessarily agree with Busa about the reasons and solutions relating to the failure of the social partners to agree on the short, medium, and long-term plans for economic recovery. However, the observation they make that the net like social partners have not made as much progress as the situation requires in agreeing upon and implementing fundamental issues imperative for economic growth is correct. This is very disturbing indeed. And in the first October 2020 parliamentary address we have cited, President Ramaphosa said there's even the darkest clouds has a silver lining. We need to see this moment as a rupture with the past and an opportunity to drive fundamental and lasting change. It is an opportunity not only to recover the ground that we have lost over the course of the pandemic, but to place the economy of an, on a new path to growth. We are therefore presenting before this joint sitting of parliament and the country a reconstruction and recovery plan to drive growth that is inclusive and transformative. And he said, we shall not rest until we have built a new economy based on fairness, on justice and equality. And this is the task of our generation to renew, to repair, to rebuild. But as we all know, President Maposa was talking about an economy in dire straits, in which at least 40% are unemployed, in which at least 50% of the population lives below the upper bound poverty line, and which has the highest income inequality in the world. In this context, in February 2021, this year's budget review of the National Treasury says that the economic outlook remains highly uncertain and the economic effects of the pandemic are far-reaching. By the third quarter of 2020, there were 1.7 million fewer jobs than in the same period in 2019. Rising unemployment and income losses have entrenched existing inequalities. GDP is only expected to recover to pre-pandemic levels in late 2023. And given South Africa's structural constraints, its recovery will be slower than many of its developing country peers. And National Treasury said beyond the pandemic, Lifting barriers to growth South Africa, lifting barriers to growth South Africa faces severe economic challenges. Real GDP per person has been falling since 2013-2014, meaning that the average South African is becoming poorer, despite high and rising fiscal deficits. Private and public investments are lower than any time since 2005, having declined to 12.5% and 5.4% of the GDP, respectively, in 2019. And in its July 2020 document, a new inclusive economy for future for South Africa, business for South Africa, the formation representing the private sector, says absent decisive leadership and action, South Africa will not be able to escape the pernicious effects of policy uncertainty corruption, lack of accountability, and the lack of capacity which were all evident prior to the crisis. These will continue to depress growth and they may become so entrenched that they lock in a negative growth, they lock in a negative growth trajectory for the next decade. 
If, however, the country's leadership makes the right strategic choices over the near term and takes decisive and bold action based on a data-driven, empirical, and rational approach, then South Africa may be capable of delivering economic growth of 5% per annum or more, potentially to double GDP over the next 10 years, and materially reduce unemployment, inequality, and poverty in the process. As business, that was a business view. The hard reality, however, is that this achievement and the glorious outcome spelled out by President Ramaphosa cannot be realized except through a serious, real, and implemental economic, implementable economic reconstruction and recovery plan to which all the social partners are, co are committed. As President Ramaphosa said, that glorious outcome is about a rupture with the past and an opportunity to drive fundamental and lasting change. A rupture with the past is about the achievement of that historic objective, the eradication of the legacy of apartheid and colonialism, and therefore a decisive advance towards the creation of the non-racial, non-sexist, and prosperous society prescribed by our national constitution. In this context, I recall a very disturbing observation made by Arthur Fraser, the former State Security Agency DG, when he said some former apartheid operatives continue to work to destroy institutions of the democratic state. I meant this, mentioned this to draw attention to the task in the context of the economic recovery to defeat what has been a sustained campaign to destroy the state corporations. The social partners led by government have an absolute responsibility to the millions of our people urgently to work together to produce and implement the said reconstruction and recovery plan. And here I mean a plan, not a vision, important as the latter might be. And in this regard, they must be guided by what Kosatu said, namely that organized labor's approach is based upon a social compact where all the parties from government to labor, business, and society make a contribution, and where necessary, a sacrifice for the sake of the national interest. The extraordinary work which Walter Sisulu and his other outstanding comrades did, successfully to lead the liberation struggle for half a century to its victory, required mastery of the complex strategy and tactics which, despite all domestic and international opposition, led to the birth of a democratic South Africa. It is obvious that, when this, that what this emphasizes is that fortunately the movement for national liberation had in Walter Sisulu, his fellow leaders and the cadres of the movement, genuine revolutionaries who could think. Indeed, we know this as a matter of fact that the most determined opponents of the ANC here at home consistently advanced to themselves a strategic proposition that they would only be able to defeat, defeat the ANC when it ceased to think. In my comments so far, I've spoken of two major challenges our country faces. The task to achieve the genuine renewal and refocus of the ANC, the dominant political formation in our, in our country, and the fundamental progressive socioeconomic transformation of our society. Of course, there are other, other challenges we do not have time to address, but which will have to be attended to. What all this means is that, as demonstrated to us by Walter Sisulu and his comrades, our society, including its political formations, will have to generate within its ranks the cadre which would also have the mastery of the complex strategy and tactics, which must result in the successful eradication of the legacy of colonialism and apartheid and therefore our country's fundamental socio-economic transform transformation. I believe that it is obvious that if we fail to develop this cadre, we will not accomplish the fundamental transformation that our country desperately needs. During the year 2014, the Walter Cecil University community listened to an address 
by Ms. Nombulelo Hakula, entitled Repositioning Education Central in the South African Transformation Agenda to deal with socioeconomic challenges facing the country in the 21st century. And she said, in the South African Green Paper of December 2006 on higher education transformation, Professor Bengu, the former Minister of Education, states that higher education is one of the most important activities organized in modern society. It creates a demanding but rewarding environment in which individuals may realize their creative and intellectual potential. Through high-level training across the disciplines, it equips, equips people with the necessary knowledge, the skills and values to play a wide range of social roles and to become effective citizens. And through research and the production of knowledge, higher education provides a society with the capacity to innovate, to adapt, and to advance. And Ms. Hakula went on to say it is about time that South Africa faces up to the triple challenge of unemployment, poverty, and inequality with education playing its vital, if not the main role, towards winning this battle. Education is not an end in itself. It serves broader objectives. We cannot continue to view education in isolation to its environment. And the question is, are institutions of higher learning up to the challenge? In 2016, when the then Vice Chancellor of WSU, Professor Rob Midgley, emphasized the point raised by Ms. Akula when he told the graduation ceremony that the reality is that only 4% of black people complete a degree. Our graduates, therefore, belong to a privileged group. This also increases the responsibilities that they have, especially to ensure that their privilege also impacts on their communities back home. So he said, graduates, please use your education wisely and make a difference to other people's lives. The question whether institutions of higher learning were up to the challenges posed, challenge posed by Ms. Akula was obviously very appropriate, certainly in the context of the development of the cater for transformation we have spoken of. Exactly the educated cohort among our people which must play the role identified by Ms. Akula and later by Professor Rob Midgley. However, because of the strategic importance to the future of our country, creation of the critical mass of the cadre for transformation that Ms. Akula and I have spoken of, which must be developed through our system of formal education, we must consider the matter of the readiness or otherwise of the institutions of higher learning together with the other levels in our educational system. What is happening in our education system? Dramatically and painfully represented by the dropout rates throughout the various stages of the process of learning should sound a very loud alarm that something must be done to address many, many patent deficiencies within the system. We do not have time today to make a comprehensive presentation about this matter, but let us mention a few figures with which you will be familiar. It was reported in 2017 that around 60% of young South Africans effectively drop out of school with no school living qualification to their names. And that out of each 100 learners that begin school in grade one, earlier this year, the Department of Higher Education and Training reported that in the period 2016 to 2018, only 9.2% of students were enrolled for the National Certificate Vocational Level 2 in 2016, completed the qualification within the three year expected time frame which they said was a far cry from the target of 75% set by the National Development Plan for 2030. And all the foregoing communicates a deeply troubling story that practically our educational system destroys the futures of many of our young people. 
and simultaneously Flay fails to create the critical mass of the transformation Kaikeda we've spoken of. This university, Walter Sulu University, enjoys the unique privilege and unmatched honor of having been named after, named after an eminent human being and an outstanding architect of our emancipation. However, I believe that that unique privilege and the unmatched honor carry with them a heavy and serious obligation for the university to be as excellent as Walter Sisulu was, or at worst, earnestly to strive to, strive to discharge that obligation. In her article on the impact of COVID-19 on online teaching and learning at a historically black university in South Africa, a case study of Buffalo City campus, your colleague, Victoria Magaba, makes some important observations about historically black universities. And she says, historically black universities are situation, situated in small towns and the majority of students come from former homelands that were created as form of segregation during apartheid. And most of these universities are mad with challenges. For example, they are poorly resourced. They attract lots of students from underprivileged backgrounds as they are mostly located near small towns and rural areas where job prospects are scarce. A high number of students enrolled at these institutions come from schools which are themselves poor resourced, poorly resourced, meaning that they are not exposed to technology like computers and therefore the students start university with no computer skills. And she said by virtue of its location, Walter Sisulu University attracts a lot of students from the above category, meaning that the university has to put in measures to support students to have computer skills and for lecturers to be trained in, incorporating, in incorporating this in their lessons. And yet another of your colleagues, Koanda Makala, also reflected on this reality uh, in an article which was entitled Peer Assisted Learning Programs. And he said the majority of the students who enroll at Walter Sisulu University in South Africa are not equipped with the necessary academic or learning skills to cope with the university environment, and he said especially in mechanical engineering. And in order to address this gap, a peer-assisted learning program was implemented to provide support targeting high-risk subjects for at-risk students in mechanical engineering at WSU. The program therefore is proactive and student-driven in that senior students assist junior students with the academic work and learning processes. And he said the program is designed to encourage collaborative and cooperative learning, learning approaches during group sessions and active student engagement to support student learning. I've referred to these articles to make this statement that I believe that by working in such a focused way to empower the students to succeed in their studies rather than drop out, WSU is indeed responding to its obligation to honor the memory of a truly humanist change agent, Walter Sisulu. It is also important in this same context that located where you are, you have positioned WSU as a developmental comprehensive university, which provides more than 186 qualifications, focuses on urban renewal and rural development. Without detailing any further your other outstanding achievements, including the important role you are playing in adding properly qualified people to what we have called the critical mass of the transformation cadre, I would make bold to say that our beloved, beloved leader, Carmela, and his dear wife, also our leader, Mama Albertina, are very proud of this, their own university. What you have done and are doing here at Walter Sisulu University serves as an example and a challenge to all of us in our country, and, and especially those of us who claim Comrades Walter and Albertina Sisulu as our comrades and leaders to approach the historic task of the fundamental transformation of our country with the same dedication 
as well as the commitment truly to serve the people of South Africa, which you continue to sustain. As I was about to end my oration, the day we laid our father and leader Walter Sisulu to rest, I said voices of amazement and surprise have spoken of a miracle that many things they thought impossible in our country have been done. They have endowed the outcomes with the attributes of a miraculous wonder. But we who have the gift of knowledge, the people of whom the poet Khonem Kai spoke, know that the miracle is not in the creation, but in the creators. It is not in the outcomes, but in the blessings unbound that gave us a Walter Sisulu, whose quiet voice and quiet ways and gentle touch gave our people the knowledge and conscience and conviction to do what is right, the impulse to create the outcomes that evoke pride and joy in all of us and give us cause to dance in celebration of our humanity. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank <clears throat> you.